Thank you very much for the invitation to talk about um, my new book, Nice Work. To explain the genesis of Nice Work, I think um, I need to reach back briefly into my past uh, work in television. Doing that job, I was at various times struck by just how strange an occupation it was. For instance, I recall traveling from Moscow to St. Petersburg in the depths of a white winter on an overnight train in the company of Russian nationalists who were running amok through the carriages emptying bottle after bottle of vodka down their throats. They were accompanying their eccentric leader, Boris Zhirinovsky, and I was with Zhirinovsky. Oh, oh, what heavenly pleasure for the purposes of producing a story on him. It was, I can tell you, a rather long night. A couple of days later for that same report, I remember standing knee-deep in snow delivering a piece to camera um, about the fall of communism. And I was delivering that piece to camera for so long that my jaw seized up. And all this I said to myself at the time um, for 15 seconds uh, on television. Surely this was not normal, I thought. There had to be other jobs in the world that were more regular than this. What did other people do for a living? Now, um, there are a few admissions about the, uh, the birth of this book that are not entirely pleasant for someone like me to have to make, but here we are amongst friends, so I'll go for it. Ignorance is a terrible thing to admit uh, for someone who's made a living as a journalist. And although I know um, pretty much all of you in this room know better, there is a popular wisdom that journalists are savvy and smart. I've been on the receiving end of this misapprehension quite often over the years. You can be sitting at a lunch or a dinner and an argument arises about something or other. It can be about the price of petrol or um, at the rate of the, about the rate of uh, melting glaciers or whether they're melting at all. And someone turns for a definitive ruling um, inexplicably as far as I'm concerned to the journalist at the table. There is an expectation that a job in the field of disseminating information means that all the information that's ever passed your lips or through your word processor is um, ready to go. You've got it ready to go to expand on and to draw definitive conclusions from when required. Well, the fact is that the amount of material that, uh, that passes before and through the average journalist, journalist is immense. It may be that on Monday you're asked to investigate the dirty dealings of a used car salesman. So you accumulate some information and then a bit more information until you can present a more or less coherent story about that particular dirty car dealer. When it's all over and the report's been published and broadcast, then a generalist reporter moves on. It is Wednesday and so it could be time for an analysis of tribal conflict in Yemen or for a test of national literacy or an inside look at brothels, just to take one example. In fact, the brothel is a convenient place to stop to consider the journalist's work um, because <laughs> as a journalist you are open to all comers, so to speak, and required to love the one you're with until you're paid to move on to someone else. So with, this is not delicate, but so with three decades of whoring behind me <laughs> and with time to consider my sordid past, I thought of all the things I didn't know about the people I had interviewed or grilled or cross-examined or whichever expression you'd like to use. In the past, I would, for instance, interview a CEO a chief executive officer, for instance, and would question him or her about a particular issue that was making waves at the time. And then I'd go home. But that, what was often missing for me was uh, a context for what that person actually did all day, aside from giving interviews, of course. Uh, the kind of work that I uh, did on television often dictated that I drop into the professional and sometimes even the personal uh, life of an individual, cherry pick a newsworthy morsel from it and retreat. But later I found myself asking what did these people do when I wasn't around? What exactly were their days filled up with uh, when the excitement or God forbid the trauma of media exposure died down? What was the actual job that they did? What were the fundamental requirements for it? How did their days start and finish? 
to uh, pursue the CEO example a little longer, what made a person a good or an incompetent CEO? What did so-called dedication to that job mean? And how much of the flesh and blood person had to be given over to this job of CEO-ing? How much, if anything, could be withheld in doing this job? How much did it mean to a given CEO to be one? Was it just a way to pass the time? Uh, was it just a way of pa uh, making a buck? Uh, was it a contest in which you tried to knock off the next CEO? Or was it a calling? So for nice work, I really wanted to hang around as unobtrusively as possible to watch what went on in people's working days. I didn't, in this case, go in search of uh, famous people. That wasn't my interest, but as it turns out, some of the workers I, I shadowed uh, were publicly known beyond their own sphere. Uh, sometimes my task involved uh, situations that didn't, I have to say, exactly come naturally to me. For instance, as I stood in a sculpture life class observing the work of a sculptor, I found myself staring at the plump, bare bottom of a naked young woman. And as I did that, um, I admit I felt strange. Um, I was there to see how a master sculptor instructed his students, so of course I had nothing else to do but to watch, stand and stare. So there was I and the dust and the dead silence watching students moulding tiny bits of clay into bottoms. And I watched them as their eyes travelled back and forth from the live bottom and the breasts and all the other naked bits and back to their own clay recreations. And frankly, I felt like a Mormon in a bar, but there it was, all, all part of my job. In order to uh, write nice work, then, I did not uh, just venture into working worlds where I felt comfortable. My experience with a boxer in training for a comeback was another case in point. I had never understood uh, boxing, neither the reason for its existence uh, nor the enthusiasm of its fans, but I admit I was curious and I soon got into the swing of attending and spending time at an inner city boxing training gym. Now, when I mentioned to women in particular that I was shadowing a boxer and consorting with what we always call colourful characters in, in his gym, I would get in response a facial expression that combined distaste with pity. And um, I felt dirty, but only for a moment. Um, because my time with a boxer was rather interesting. Uh, when I first met him, he was attempting to reduce a somewhat flabby 100 kilo body to the weight that his trainer insisted was necessary for a decent showing in the ring, and that was um, he needed to drop 20 kilos. Um, that did sound like a lot to me. Practically, for Brett the Boxer, this meant leaping out of bed uh, in the wee small hours to pedal on an exercise bike before driving to a ditch in a suburban street to do his day job of repairing water pipes. It meant confining his diet to sad drips of fruit juice, tiny morsels of fruit and pale thin bits of chicken with, um, when his favourite foods were really pizza and ice cream, of which he normally consumed huge buckets all on his own. Now, after a day of ripping monstrously heavy pipes out of the ground while standing in the mud and the muck that I witnessed, he'd go sparring in the gym. He'd follow that with running, weightlifting, muscle crunching as the sun set and uh, day turned into night. And the next day he'd wake up and do it all again. Um, now, there was a complication. On the first day that I watched Brett sparring in the gym, he tore a ligament in his left hand. This, I have to say, was not a good start to our relationship as Brett is a southpaw, that is, a um, left-hander, and the injury set him back for months. And in fact, he thought I'd jinxed him, and um, I think that's a distinct possibility, actually. Now, while Brett's hand was out of action, um, he and a few friends took me along to see a fight, and it turned out to be quite a night. At one point, I found myself standing in an open men's cubicle, uh, toilet cubicle, at the back of Blacktown RSL in Sydney, just, that I, just so that I could fit into a room where a number of boxers were limbering up for the night's events. Uh, they were throwing punches into practice mitts their trainers were holding up, or shadow boxing. Now, as I propped in the uh, toilet cubicle, I particularly noticed a huge man whose dark skin was oiled to perfection, I have to say, greased to perfection, and who, for reasons best known only to him, was delivering blow after blow to one of those electric hand dryers you see in public toilets. Um, 
At the same time, the wizened old guy who was his trainer seemed to be passing on some pretty basic instructions on how to duck and weave. Um, I later learned that with just one professional fight to his name, Royce Seo was the boxer's name, was about to enter the ring with another boxer named Solomon Homono, a boxer whom the ring announcer called the excitement machine of boxing. A former rugby league forward, Homono had, count them, 16 professional fights to his name, 15 victories, 14 by knockout. Now, this didn't sound like an even contest, obviously. Um, the bell rang, and these two huge men, mountains, really, faced each other in the ring. I looked down, as one does, to make a note in my notebook. Dutifully, when I looked up again, the excitement machine, 16 fights, 15 victories, 14 by knockout, was flat on his back. <laughs> his eyes were fogged while hand dryer man was leaping excitedly around the ring. So this was boxing, I thought, nice work. But just as I was launching into you know, one of those thoughtful meditations on the cruel twists of the game, um, I discovered that success had gone to CO's head. He decided that while the excitement machine was down, he'd shoot another couple of big punches to the man's jaw. And um, since this was an outrageous breach um, of the never hit a man when he's down rule of boxing, and let's face it by now of life as well, um, the entire room stood up as one and roared with rage. Hand dryer man, as you can imagine, made a very quick exit um, from the ring. Um, and uh, in fact, there was a posse of police that followed him out, fearing that the excitement machine's fans might want to take things into their matters into their own hands. Um, look, there was more, much more that happened on the night. Uh, I refer you to pages 48 to 54 of Nice Work. Here I was, a boxing novice in the middle of absolute mayhem, but in the end, you know, I thought I'd been lucky to be there, uh, lucky to have a ringside seat. And as the promoter pointed out to me, when a shower of blood sprayed from the ring during another fight, lucky I wore black. <laughs> the um, elephant in the room, uh, not in the room but in the ring also, is of course death, or at least the possibility of it. Uh, Brett, the boxer, deals with it. Uh, by saying that he prefers to do his business very quickly. Gets in, gets out, with a bit of luck, knocks out his opponent and goes home. Uh, one of my other workers that I shadowed, though, had to look death in the face every day as part of her job. Um, that is what forensic anthropologists do. Their specialty is um, osteology, that is uh, skeletal anatomy and biology. In practice, it uh, means examining the remains of uh, human beings in a legal context, so providing information to police and the courts about the cause of a person's death. The working days of a forensic anthropologist can vary greatly, as I witnessed. One day, I watched um, a young forensic anthropologist, Soren Blau, who's based here in Melbourne at the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine, uh, the mother of two small children, giving evidence in the Supreme Court about a particularly grisly murder. The remains of a young man had been found in a drain wrapped in a sleeping bag. Animals had begun to scavenge the body. Uh, Blau had been present during the opening of that sleeping bag and she had examined the remains. In the courtroom I watched a, a portly grey-haired man sitting in the dock. The charge was that he'd been involved in torturing the victim before killing him. The forensic anthropologist was required to tell the court and the jury about what she'd seen, what the particular defects in the dead man's bones told her about the way that he had died. Now that was one kind of working day for the forensic anthropologist, one hell of a day, I have to say. I saw quite another kind when I accompanied Blau to East Timor on her mission to solve an 18-year-old mystery. She had assembled an international team to excavate a site that many suspected could be a possible secret burying place of people who had disappeared after a protest march in November of 1991, a march in the East Timorese capital of Dili. Um, many of the young people who'd marched against Indonesian rule on that day had been shot in the grounds of a cemetery known as Santa Cruz. I'm sure many of you would know about this um, uh, event. An unknown number of those protesters disappeared. Uh, despite inquiries and commissions, there were no bodies, 
no graves. The forensic scientists had made uh, several attempts to find answers without success, uh, previous attempts. This time they were digging on the strength of persistent stories about a particular site uh, west of Dili. Now, I have to say the work very quickly and very dramatically paid off. On the second day of the excavation, I watched as a honey-coloured skull suddenly appeared from beneath a mound of earth. Uh, it was, uh, for me, uh, an outsider to this extraordinary process, an electric moment. Uh, I think for the anthropologists as well, judging by their expressions when they made this remarkable discovery. Uh, in the days that followed, I found myself staring into other graves containing human remains. Sometimes buried with them were belongings and clothing that were, ironically, perfectly preserved. Uh, the bold, for instance, striped shorts of one skeleton are fixed in my memory, as are the high top sneakers that the young man in the grave had put on the day he died. Now they were attached to the end of smooth, fleshless leg bones. On some days, the forensic anthropologists would be lying stretched out in the graves next to the skeletal remains. They worked with the fine brushes to clear away the soil from the bones to make sure that the grave's contents were preserved in good condition for the next stage of their investigations. At the end of the day, they would leave the cemetery with large brown paper bags containing the bones they'd exhumed. Sometimes the contents were too large for the bags, and the longest bones, the femurs, would poke out from the top. And it was strange to watch them going through this process, thinking that they were carrying in their arms all that was left of a human being. The exhumations, of course, were only the first stage of their work. There'd be many more working days involving the reconstruction of body parts from the bones, interviewing relatives of the missing and taking blood samples in the hope of an eventual uh, DNA match. Several months later, Three of the first five DNA tests revealed that the remains were indeed of three young people, two 18-year-olds, one 22-year-old, who'd marched to Santa Cruz Cemetery 18 years ago. This was a world first. The first time that any of the bodies missing from the notorious Santa Cruz massacre had been found and identified. And when the mother of one of the victims came to see what remained of her son on a table in the mortuary, she pointed to something odd in the skull. And the forensic scientists, it was their job to tell her that this was a gunshot wound to the head. In effect, they had to tell her that her son had died a terrible death. This uh, forensic uh, breakthrough was by any standards of this particular job a significant success, a job well done, if you like. But I wondered, though, how anyone doing this kind of work could assimilate it with a normal home life. How does it feel to go home at night with the day's work still on your mind? In this case, as I mentioned, the forensic anthropologist is a young mother of two small children. She explains to me in the book, as best she can, how she manages what in some ways amounts to a double life, I suppose. She admits that uh, after a few weeks away working in dusty graves, she finds it hard to adjust to conversations about tuck shop duty uh, back at home and one could hardly blame her. Now, look, this all sounds a bit grim, doesn't it, really? Um, so I wanted you to know that not all of my working days were of that ilk, or my observed working days. Um, one, in fact, was full of torrid sex. I enjoyed this. Yes, this job of writing can be fun. I enjoyed this um, courtesy of a person known as a Foley artist. Now, I don't know if anyone in the room knows what a Foley artist does. Uh, for those who don't, a Foley artist goes to work every day to make the sound effects of humans and animals for feature films and television programs. To do this, the Foley artist um, uses a vast array of objects. In one studio which, that I visited, which was a cross between a warehouse and a junkyard, I saw, amongst many other things, the following, some unhinged doors, a bike helmet, a sink top, a tree branch, a collection of suitcases, a teapot, a baby stroller, a sheet of corrugated iron, a birdcage, a roll of carpet, some wicker baskets, a bucket and a cocktail shaker. And this is but a small sampling of what is available uh, for the Foley artist. Uh, you never know as a Foley artist when you might need an unhinged door for that very special movie moment. Um, 
The Foley artist's work requires banging and rubbing together and scraping all those kinds of objects to make authentic sounding sounds for movies and films. So, for instance, and I, this has probably not been preying on your mind, but if you need to make the sound of a human spine snapping, um, this is what Foley artist I shadowed, Helen Brown, uh, had to provide for a science fiction film, A Cabbage is a Winner. Um, <laughs> Just one twist, I'm told, and you're there. So there you are for future reference. Um, so the sounds that uh, you take for granted when you watch a character in, let's say, a, a period film, wearing a long gown, moving across the floor, they're the sort of sounds provided by uh, a Foley artist. And now for the sex. Um, on one of my days with Helen, she was working on an episode of the Underbelly series and a particularly racy one at that. One of her tasks was to recreate the sounds of a drug baron, a nasty piece of work, as he would be in Underbelly, having raunchy sex with his blonde floozy. Um, I'll let you for a moment consider the, the uh, challenges for the Foley artists of that. Um, but the solution to that challenge is sorbeline cream. Um, it's a natural. Um, Helen had used it many times before in all sorts of sticky situations and she knew that it was a lifesaver. So as the drug baron, excuse the expression, mounted his blonde, the Foley artist sat on a stool um, next to a microphone rubbing sorbeline cream up and down her legs and arms. <laughs> and yes, it sounded just like the real thing. Um, <laughs> Needless to say, I now look at sorbeline uh, cream with new eyes, as <laughs> you probably will after this. Um, uh, one mystifying thing I must say seen in Underbelly, and I haven't seen that much of Underbelly, was, was the scene where the blonde floozy was also shaving her legs in the bath, awaiting her, her drug baron friend. Now, I don't, I don't quite see that as sensuous, I have to say, but apparently it was meant to be. How do you make the sound of, you know, leg shaving on, in a television program? The answer, once again, don't strain, is a clothes peg rubbed up and down on your calf. Now, um, I need to get uh, serious for just one moment. Um, there was in summary, a, a factor that was common to all the workers I spent time with. Uh, none of them uh, could imagine a life doing anything else. Writing the book, I was struck once again by the willingness of the workers to honestly open up their lives to my prying eyes. Um, I think that if we who do this kind of thing, observing and writing um, for a living were to be honest, we'd have to say that it's a strange hunger that we satisfy by doing it. Uh, we're drawn to the lure of learning a secret or if not quite a secret then having privileged entree to the ways, or to the ways that other people live, of being able to see things in a light that few others can and then interpreting that for anyone who may open a book like Nice Work. Um, that is um, my work, a little strange, you might think, still. Um, and just like the people I wrote about, I can't imagine doing anything else, which is why I'm very pleased to have had this opportunity to speak with you tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>